Tuhan. Foundation. I never know the date, August 17th. Um, and what I need at this point is acknowledgement of any media that is attending the meeting. Is any media here? I didn't see any on the thing, but there were, was a caller, I believe. Have we identified everybody? Hi. Yeah. Looks like we have. Hi, John. This is Chris in the boardroom. Sorry to interrupt. So the media is actually uh, being um, broadcasted through uh, Village Television. So technically, in a sense, we're being broadcasted. So that would be a form of media. Okay. So please note that. Um, then I'll need a motion for the approval of the agenda. I so move. Second. Okay, when you make a motion, because there's so many small boxes, just say your name so the recorder can get the information. Um, I think it was Yvonne, I didn't get who seconded it. Bert Moldau, second. Thanks, Bert. Okay, um, let's see, we uh, have chair remarks. As uh, you may have overheard Betty and I talking a minute ago, I feel like today's meeting is fine tuning um, the prior meeting's budget information and we have a proposal that delivers what we've asked for, which is no increase on the assessment for 2021. So the starting point that I'm asking uh, staff to provide is what changed? You know, what are the differences specifically? So we can dial into those. Um, and then I'll leave another general comment and turn things over to the staff, which is let's make sure that the comments we're focused on, it's your call, for, you know, ask your question, that's why we're here. But trying to focus on the big dollar items first is going to be in our best interest. We have a finance meeting Wednesday. We could always get information on a smaller item and review it at that time. We're not finalizing the budget today. But I just want to be sure, since we've got 8% reduction, that we really analyze what that 8% means, see how we want to deal with it. And if there's areas you still feel uncomfortable about, you can count on them being addressed. At least I'll make sure it gets followed up on. So those are my chair remarks. Um, Next, we're going to move on to member comments. Chris, do we have any member comments? And then you can call on Bert Moldo before or after whatever's appropriate procedurally because he had a comment. So, yeah, John, good morning and good morning to everybody. So we have two uh, member comments that are not related to the board meeting. Um, the first person we can go with is Bert Moldau, and then I'll read the member comments from the uh, meetings at VMS.org uh, account where members can actually email their questions in. Okay. Should I start, John? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, probably not popular, but there are two items I would like to see added to the budget for 2021. The first addresses the demand charges we have been paying to SCE. You know, it's no secret to VMS and even to some of the members of the board that we're paying as high as 50% over the actual energy consumption to SCE. For instance, uh, a study a couple of years ago, we found out that we were paying over $100,000 a year in demand charges just for the community center. The study I did pointed out that at Clubhouse 6 one year, we were paying 36% over, the library 33% over, and who knows what we're paying in the other builders because I didn't study them. Uh, we, you know, yet uh, with such high poten potential cost savings, if we can cut into those demand charges, and we could, nothing has been done. Uh, and from the budget that we are showing here, nothing will be done for another year. We know that if we install batteries and or solar, uh, that we can cut into this waste and pay down the cost with the energy savings. But we're doing nothing at the moment. At least we're not considering it. Uh, and the thing is that we don't have to hire expensive consultants. Typically within this industry, vendors will study and make recommendations free of charge. And they even do this with an understanding that they have to go into competitive bidding when you know they made the determination and made their recommendations. So 
it's it's nothing that you know we really have to think about spending a lot of money on consultants for. The other thing that it would address is the power outage situation that we're facing. Uh, one step further from batteries and solar or any other alternative source of energy uh, is what's called a microgrid, which enables us to disconnect uh, when uh, we want to or when energy costs self-generated are cheaper than the energy costs that we're uh, paying to SCE. So this is a very efficient way of dealing with uh, energy costs. The second item that I want to address is involves safety. Most of our GRF buildings are harbors for viruses. You can't open the windows. Uh, air is circulated only through the HVAC systems, and we may only be adding a small percentage of air. Needless, uh, there's really a need to investigate existing solutions. Uh, I recently uh, circulated a report uh, describing several alternatives that we can apply. Uh, and this includes a uh, ballpark price for installation of an ultraviolet system in the ducts for the newly proposed PAC HVAC. Uh, but we need to consider solutions for all GRF buildings, not just the PAC, for the safety of our residents and for the staff. Uh, we could even do something now. And I'm not, you know, I am not aware of the type of filters we are currently using in our HVAC systems, but we need to check because there is one filter that can significantly reduce germs and to a degree is effective uh, in viruses because it filters much finer particles than the typical filter. And these are called HEPA filters, H-E-P-A, okay? Uh, they're not a substitute for ultraviolet, which is probably the one that I, which is the one that I'm recommending that we look at, but it would certainly help reduce uh, small particles uh, that carry the viruses. And uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you. The next person that um, we have for member comments is actually Anthony Liberator. Anthony, you uh, messaged us in via email about um, an item you wanted read aloud. Did you want me to read your email or did you want to speak about the items that you wrote about? Yeah, go ahead. You can read them. It's not, not that big. Just, yeah, go ahead, read them. Sure, no problem. So the email begins with uh, need answers for two issues. One, need to show us the revenue generated from AgeWell using the employee parking lot facility. We should be charging them land use, i.e. take normal values of the land per square foot, establish their square footage and, time it is, and times it by the value of the square footage plus 15% for overhead and 10% contingency. Where does this appear in the report? And then number two is earlier in the year, we directors in United were given numbers leading up to GRF budget. There, were, there was one line item that states nine PU trucks at 374,000 and each of them cost 400, or sorry, 41,555 each. That is absurd. These trucks are utility vehicles and, do not, and not duty cycle vehicles. There are three vehicle auctions, Richie Bros, Iron, or three, excuse me. There are three vehicle auctions, Richie Bros, Iron Mountain, and Las Vegas small vehicle auction. Depending on the market, it will, it will about 650 to haul them to our shop. There are three vehicle auctions, Rich, or, no, that just repeats. Um, there are some who would say we need the warranty. Well, your warranty is voided when you don't perform manufacturer stated preventative maintenance. In my frequent trips through the yards, there is not preventative maintenance being performed on those utility vehicles. A lot of directors waste time looking at numbers, which is looking at your kids filled milk. You have to get out in front and make the numbers respectfully, Anthony Liberator. Well. And then there's there's one more uh, uh, member comments, John. If that's okay. Please do. And this one comes from uh, Sandra uh, Smolinski, and her comment is: the Laguna Woods Village website 
has the current number of COVID cases. It also has the positivity rate for Orange County. Why doesn't it show positivity rate for Laguna Woods? Thank you. And there are no more member comments via email. Okay, thank you. Um, let's take, go through them. Well, I'll just ask, does any, Jeff, obviously I'd like you to comment on the positivity rate for Laguna Woods. Let's start with that one. So I think that'll be the easiest to, to respond to. I'll let you go. Certainly. Um, good morning, everybody. With regards to um, the reporting process for uh, COVID-19 cases for Orange County, uh, they only report um, a number relative to the city of Laguna Woods. There is no uh, specific um, documentation with regards to the village in and of itself. All you know, obviously, we know that we're uh, 90 to 95% of the population of the city of Laguna Woods is reported on a city by city basis. And with regards to the um, rate, it's based on a county basis. So this morning I indicated that the positive rate was at 6.9%, which had gone down recently, um, but that is um, only for Orange County. At this point in time, they haven't done a specific positivity rate with per um, city. Uh, anybody else have a comment on that particular question? All right, moving on. Uh, anybody have a comment on the SCE demand charges or uh, Director Liberatore's comments about different uh, items he'd like to audit? There is a uh, question in the chat box from uh, Egon who asked, what is the demand charge? Is it a flat fee or higher rate for higher usage? Um, I want to defer the answer to that question simply because that's the scope of today's discussion for the budget. And I realize this is a Q&A about that, but what I was going to suggest, and if, for, if you really want to go through it now, I don't want to hold you back, but I was going to suggest we get a good list of all energy-related savings. You've brought up multiple opportunities and quantify what the projected savings are so we can get them on the finance agenda get them in the right place to be evaluated, whether it's MNC, finance, or whatever, and then bring them, you know, for the possibility of, a, of an alteration to the budget, or, you know, if there's something that has to be changed or implemented, we can do a proposal for that. But it feels like right now, there are just really, really good ideas that we don't have quantified. Um, so rather than define everything, I'd rather get them spelled out item for item and really study them. And, you know, if they are worth enough money to justify the time and effort, let's do them. Uh, they all sound like they are. I just don't know what kind of money we're talking about. Um, and Egon, I'm going to let you speak, though, because you put a question in there. Is that adequate for today? Can you get with her and talk with him about that, or do you want to go through it now? If, if you want it. I, I can get with Bert on that, but it's a simple question. I just asked. Are demand charges like a flat fee, or are they the variable charge for electricity that you're talking about? Let me answer that quickly. Uh, sure. The power company has to have rolling, what they call uh, rolling energy sources to handle instantaneous changes in the demand. Okay, so what they do is they, they run up the amount of energy they're generating for beyond, maybe 20% beyond uh, what... Um, there's actually demand, okay? And we wind up, and the consumers wind up paying a demand charge when they do exceed a set demand for, for their specific location. And we are exceeding that demand constantly. And we are paying through the nose for energy basically that we don't use, that they're generating, okay? Because they have to be ready to handle a specific peak demand. Do we have any estimate, literally off the top of your head, because we'll dig in deeper of how much money we're talking about per year? I'll bet it's over a quarter of a million dollars a year. So could, we have a could we have a sample bill that actually shows those demand charges or a few sample bills? Thank you. Yeah. I, I, there are reports that I have done over the last two years that you can go back you know, and look at, or I can try to drag them up. Well, I'll get, I'm going to get with you, Bert. We're going to get this organized so we can start implementing some of this stuff. Um, okay, as far as the um, comments on the um, transportation, things of that nature, you know, maybe we can deal with them as we talk about the budget today. 
they feel to me, if anybody else has a comment, please chime in. But they feel to me like committee discussions. Are we buying the right automotive, automobiles? Are we, should we be leasing them? Um, you know, to, when, when it comes down to a budget, it feels to me like staff has done their research, staff makes a proposal of what they need to do the service they're trying to do for the next year. And, you know, if we're going to question every charge and everything they're planning on doing, um, then we're really, there's no reason for a budget. We might as well just spend our time auditing everything and, and looking at invoices and bidding and what have you. I mean, to me, that's what the committees are for. And I'm not trying to minimize that comment at all. I want to make sure we're paying the least amount, too. But we got to trust the department heads to an extent. When they come in with their proposal, um, you know, for budget purposes, we have to start with that. And then maybe we can dig deeper on those things as we go. That's my personal take on it from a budget standpoint. Does anybody else have any comment on that? Um, John, if I may, um, uh, Chris Lagenauer is on, so Chris can address probably both issues, but I'll start with the age well. Um, Chris can uh, and address the uh, question that was raised on that issue. Uh, yes, good, good morning. On the age well, that was a negotiated uh, contract that we presented to GRF for approval. Uh, there currently providing the village uh, $2,000 a month to park their vehicles there. Uh, I would remind everybody that this is part of a much bigger um, picture. Of we're trying to create a partnership with AgeWell, and I'm looking at doing uh, other things down the road with them, including uh, maintaining their vehicles, the, uh, potentially them in incorporating them some of their services, into our services so uh, the parking along with the fuel was, is kind of like the first phase of that relationship that we're trying to build with the local nonprofit with the goal obviously to to reduce our costs for our bus transportation system and provide a better service overall so that's kind of where we're at with with that as it relates to the to the vehicle purchases um, the, the numbers that we put in the budgets are just estimates. When we go to purchase, uh, we try to look at all options. Uh, leases, does it make sense to buy used ones given the market, um, new ones? Um, the warranty issue is, is always a big one. And yes, we do provide the required preventive maintenance um, on all of our vehicles. We have uh, a, a eight to 10 maintenance staff, fleet maintenance staff uh, working all day long, making sure all of our vehicles are uh, maintained properly, especially on the preventive maintenance side. So it is something that we look at and uh, we talked this, a little bit about it at our most recent MMV meeting as well. Thank you. Question in the chat box from Bunny Carpenter. Uh, it might be a specific line item. I'm not sure what trust revenue is. It says Bunny missing trust revenue and age well revenue. So I don't know how we quote that, Bunny may have to chime in. But the follow up question, well, let's start with that. There was a follow up unrelated question. Okay. Um, the trust revenue, it, the, the, the trust fee that we get from the sale of property is not included in our um, business plan version two. And also when uh, Anthony suggested, talked about the age well revenue, I completely forgot about that in, until he reminded me, but we are already experiencing that revenue and I don't think that was considered in, in, uh, in the report that we're giving right now. So the other question I had really quick, which, which was, I had talked to Chris previously and he had mentioned all the things that they were going to do, and he also mentioned with AgeWell, and he also mentioned that we were going to be able to buy gas from them at a lesser rate. So I was just wondering, is, is that in the works, or are we already experiencing uh, being able to buy uh, gas at a cheaper price? Uh, that, that contract with AgeWell for fuel has been... Uh in place for the past six months. They are in fact purchasing fuel from us. Uh, we're not purchasing fuel from them, of which we have uh, 
we charge an administrative fee to cover our cost for doing such. And I will shortly be going out to bid for the fuel contract. And with that additional fuel inventory that we're purchasing, um, I totally expect to get a much better deal on the on what we're charged for fuel because it'll, it, it basically increases our overall purchase power by by 50%. So when we do go out to bid, I am expecting a, a better price for fuel. Thank you. Uh, um, Betty, can you comment? That came up last time about where the trust facility fee shows up in this analysis. You, it, it's in the analysis under under the reserve side, correct? Yes, it's not on the first page of the business plan, but if you have your agenda with you, it's page 14 of 31, and it's a revenue stream that we put into the reserves uh, directly, so it helps fund the facilities projects. And so you can see the revenue stream for next year. We're assuming 3655500 which is um, a, a certain per, a number of resales. Uh, and I'll look up how much. 731. 731. Okay. So it's in there. Um, just want to make sure everybody knew that. I questioned that when I first looked at the silver on version one as well. Okay. Um, so that was any other director responses to member comments. Very good. Let's move on to um, the GRF business plan. Item number six is version two. And uh, I'll turn it over. I guess, Jeff, you're starting the presentation, so it's all yours. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, board and members, uh, residents, and everybody participating this morning. Good. Um, welcome. And um, this is version two. Uh, our televised version of uh, the GRF budget and business plan. So just wanted to quickly um, go over the calendar as you, um, those have the participated in the, in the past um, and this year. Uh, we've had an, a number of um, budgetary processes leading up to, we had version one, which was back in July. And prior to that, we had a lot of work um, with our departments and, and working with the GRF board and kind of getting direction. We did a survey of all the board members and what they were looking for with regards to assessment um, increases or what they would um, think was palatable during that situation. Of course, we were right in the midst of the COVID-19, so all of that was in flux and changing as we received that information back. So when we put together the um, business plan uh, version one, um, we presented that to you. Uh, it did have a proposed um, increase in the GRF budget, and clearly at that meeting, um, which we made that presentation to the GRF board, the board asked staff to go back and uh, look more specifically at our revenue and expenditures and um, be, um, try to be a little more precise with regards to how we were going to operate next year and when we were going to operate next year. And I'll talk about that a little bit um, in the future. And so today is um, version two. This is your um, the, the budget that we would expect for you to approve today. And with that approval, then um, staff will get it ready for the resolution, which you would adopt at your September meeting. So with that, I'll start walking you through the items. On that first um, page three of the, um, the agenda packet is the GRF assessment history. Uh, so what you see here is um, um, probably the most important thing is the 2021 um, assessment recommendation now is to stay at $205.60, which is the same as the assessment for 2020. And as you recall, it, um, 2020 had gone up $3 or just under, just under $3 um, from 2019. So as you can tell, um, uh, assessment history for GRF has stayed pretty flat. In fact, if you um, go back to 2029 and 2010, uh, you had assessments at $216, and now we're proposing in 2021 that we're at 205 and 60 cents. Next slide. 
staffing um, full-time equivalents within the organization. Um, we mentioned this earlier. We were at 749 back in 2012, and we are now at um, proposing in the 2021 budget a overall organization of 728 positions, full-time equivalent positions. Consolidate. Um, staffing full-time equivalents. So we have made some operational changes um, and shifted uh, in the office of the CEO and the line just below that in media communications. There was a, um, we have a new office, um, new um, manager, director of media communications. So we split this off from the CEO's office. Um, we shifted the personnel that was formerly in the CEO's office into me media and communications. And then media and communications included uh, that operation as well as our cable um, operations with regards to TV6 in that manner up there. And so there was a um, reduction in position there, which equates to the 2.94 coming out of the CEO's office and the increase of 1.83 in media and communications. Information services, um, with a half a position was reduced. In general services, uh, 5.57 positions were reduced. If you recall, that's um, primarily from outsourcing our janitorial night crew, and then we also decreased 2.57 uh, full-time equivalents due to lower bus driver hours. Under financial services, we stayed status quo, and then under security services, we are recommending 2021 that we will um, be down one position in, in that operation. In landscape services, um, we see an equivalent of a reduction of three and a half positions. I do wanna indicate that that's really a outsourcing of eight positions, and then we added back in um, a new crew um, for renovation, it's called renovation division. This is where we go in and renovate uh, landscaping um, areas. And we added a manager to that. So it's a net equivalent of a reduction of 3.5 positions. In recreation services, uh, again, a reduction full-time associated with the closure of the recreation facilities in um, January to February timeframe. This is what I mentioned before and talk about it probably a couple of times. That is a, our anticipation that we will not be opening our recreation facility, indoor recreation facilities until um, more than likely there is a vaccine and because of um, the difficulty of keeping people safe. So we're looking at starting at full-time operations with the month of March. And so in January and February, we would be uh, down positions because of that. Uh, maintenance and construction, um, going from 186 down to 179, which is um, removal of two union steward positions, reorganizing, including, uh, we're adding here, and this is one I wanted to mention why Bert was talking. Um, we are adding a facility engineer to this budget. Uh, this was a request that was made by both, um, all of the mutuals actually, and GRF, to add a position who would be uh, focused on um, trying to create um, energy savings and looking at energy savings with regards to our facilities. And that's what this um, facilities engineer would be responsible for, including some of the activity that uh, evaluation of um, some of the activity of demand charges that uh, Bert brought up. Um, we also have a reduction in two trade helpers and a reduction in seven full-time um, equivalents in carpentry, paint, and interior components due to the change um, for third uh, going to a 15-year paint cycle. Um, so that reduces the staffing requirements necessary there. GR business plan, um, this goes in now to um, on page slide number seven is our Summary of our total non-assessment revenue is the first line item there, um, which was basically a status quo there. Um, total expense um, for the 2021 plan of 246.40, that's a $5 um, increase. Uh, net operating of 186.60, um, which is $5. 
Um, again, noting that increase. Reserve funds uh, staying at $19. Uh, so uh, basically in the reserve funds, there's no change. And then the contingency fund, um, it is going down to zero, um, which um, is a $5 reduction, which offsets the $5 expense that we had in our operating budget which gets you down to your total basic assessment of $205.60, which is a zero increase in assessments for the year 2021. Now, as you recall, when, when we made version one, presented version one, we did have a um, slight increase uh, moving forward as proposed and as directed by the GRF board, it was asked for us to go back and look at areas that we could reduce in order to get down to a zero assessment. The, on page eight here, you're um, basically seeing the uh, summary of, of those changes and what they reflect. Go back, there you go. Um, so in the area of media and communications, uh, we had a reduction of $87,000. Um, this is um, cor a correction of employee benefits for part-time employees and a reduction in materials and services. In general services, $69,000 um, reduction. This version two includes a reduction in part-time bus driver hours associated with revised Saturday schedule and decrease was partially offside by increase in outsourced ride, sh ride share expense. I do want to note this one, um, we, we have been receiving uh, notification lately that we're going, which will create a, a reevaluation probably at this point. And we'll have to um, take a look at that real quick, obviously. And that is, um, we have heard from um, our rideshare partner, um, which is Lyft, uh, that they may discontinue service. Uh, if they move in that direction to discontinue service, then we're gonna have to reevaluate where we go with um, alternatives for that service or discontinue to offer that additional service at this point in time. Under financial services, um, there is a um, significant 1,022 um, or 1,022,000 in, um, which is $6.69 per manner. Um, the version two, 994K of insurance premiums for liability and property is planned to be paid out of the contingency fund. So we're shifting that expense to the contingency fund because we feel that that's a more appropriate location for that. Under security services, the 221K, um, this uh, from version one, incorrectly attributed too much cost to the mutuals and not enough to GRF. We went back and evaluated our, in detail some of our, how we were allocating our costs and based on the estimated time needed to, to service the, um, those in, increases. So this is one where we actually saw an increase in security cost, although that was offset a little bit by the fact that we're reducing one position there. Under recreation services, we had 325,000 in reduced costs. And based on the assumption of the indoor recreation facilities will reopen on March 1st of 2021, not January 1st, 2021. That also reduced, reduced revenue, but was more than offset by reducing expenditures for those operations that are indoors. Under maintenance and construction, um, consultant fees were reduced and that's what $25,000 was. And then we had miscellaneous reduction of 5,000 in expenses. And so that summary of that um, $8.58 um, per manor per month is what the, those all equate to. And as you recall, version one had that as an increase. And now with that reduction of the 8.58 per manor per month, we are down at a zero assessment. Just quickly gonna run through um, some other um, pieces of information here, um, revenue sources. These are non-assessment revenues of $13 million. These are, um, and I'm, the reason for presenting this is that there are a number of people watching um, the, for the first time, even though the boards had um, multiple times looking at this. I wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Um, so non-assessment revenue of 13 million. Um, as you can see, broadband at 39% is the largest non-assessment revenue. Um, 
The next is the trust facility fees, which um, Bunny had mentioned, uh, 28%. Golf is 13%. Uh, miscellaneous revenue is 8%. Uh, rentals and events is 6%. Our investments is 4% and the merchandise sale um, is just a little lower than that. I should say investments is 4%, excuse me. On, on the expense sources on that, this side of the equation, uh, total expenses of $39 million, uh, compensation for employees and in the related, uh, this is not just salaries and wages, this is medical life insurance. Uh, Social Security, unemployment taxes, workers' compensation insurance, and retirement um, uh, participation in a 401k. Um, th those equate to the 64%, um, which is significant, but also recognizing the fact that we are a very labor-intensive organization overall. Cable programming and franchise at 10%. Um, this is really our franchise fees more than four million dollars that we pay under utilities this is um, utilities and telephone 2.4 million we have uh, electricity at 862,000 uh, water and sewer at 781 telephone at 330,000 gas at 213 and trash at 208,000 in uh, talking um, relative to what um, member Moldau talked about and, and looking at this is certainly one of the things that we had anticipated with our um, facility engineer taking a look at the electricity side of the equation next year. Insurance um, at 6%, this is hazard and liability at 2 million, property insurance at 300K and all other insurance at 100,000. That has to do with liability, auto liability and property damage. Under outside services at 6%, outside services is about $2.4 million. That includes our janitorial services, IT at 567K, aquatics at 549,000, the Village Breeze at 272, this is the new magazine. We do have offsetting revenue there. Um, credit card tr transaction fees at about $160,000 a year and bank fees at 35, 50, excuse me, $53,000 a year. And then finally, materials and supplies at um, 1.8 million. Um, this is recru um, recruiting, DMV, registration costs, uniforms, safety, number of items um, in the materials and supplies, which equate to $1.8 million. And then we have a small op other operating expenses that are combined in that 3% category. So the next um, page is uh, GRF business plan by department. Um, as you can see um, in the office, uh, we, we moved things around as I indicated, office of the CEO had a reduction from the 2020 plan of 895 down to 717. This was primarily um, resulted in the shift of staff um, to the new media and communications um, department. And uh, so that was, um, critical to th that reduction. Then in the media and communication, you see the increase um, didn't exist before and um, went to 721, which is obviously a, a big increase, but be mindful of the fact that there was um, the reduction in the CEO's office. And also with regards to media and communication, this also combined some of the costs from TV6 and the television station, along with some modifications to salary and benefits, as well as uh, increasing of insurance in that area. In information services, um, what you see there is a $22 uh, dollar or um, a differential from 2,649,000 to 2,671. Um, the net cost of this department being at two points, almost $2.7 million. Uh, this budget increases um, the assessment by 22K due to the increased programming cost, 139K, lower miscellaneous revenue. I want to point out that in the area of revenue for cable television uh, that we receive, 
the off year, i.e. 2021, is, is not a heavily campaign um, year. So the activity with regards to people buying airtime to have commercials for running for their campaigns uh, drops down, obviously, in the odd years compared to 2020 or 2022 when we're having general primaries or, or major elections. In general services, um, the net cost of this department is $5.2 million um, for the GRF portion. The budget increases the assessment by 15K due to increased outside services and expenses for outsourcing rideshare associated with the revision to the Saturday bus service and increased telephone expense associated with the infill data use. So these are upgrades, uh, which did uh, result in a um, $22 uh, increase. Financial services, uh, the net cost for this department is $3.1 million for the GRF portion, including $1.4 million um, for certain insurance programs. This budget decreases the assessment by 41K due to a staffing reorganization and lower tax provisions. Note, and the critical part that we had talked about earlier, 994,000 of the insurance premiums for liability and property will be paid out of the contingency fund as opposed to the operation fund. In the other categories in security services, um, this is uh, going from 6,241 6, to 6,348 on your page, or 106 increase. The net cost of this department is 6.3 million um, for the GRF portion. The budget increase uh, the assessment by 106,000 due to plan wage adjustments for minimum wage increase and the reallocation that we mentioned earlier, uh, just making sure that the allocation was appropriate for the 2021 uh, process. Under landscape services, uh, the net um, cost of this department is $1.1 million. And this, is, uh, this budget increased uh, the assessment by 51,000 due to plan wage adjustments and related benefit expenses. Uh, this was partially offset offset by savings and wages associated with outsourced work, um, but it does have a regular increase due to union wages and insurance. Under recreation services, um, we are at 6.2 million for the GRF portion. Uh, under recreation services, all of which is included in the operating assessment. The budget decreased the assessment by 132K, primarily due to the closure of recreation facilities um, as proposed during the pandemic and, and the fact that um, we're looking at those recreational um, facilities, the indoor facilities being closed and, um, and continue to be closed and or on a limited basis in January and February and, and then fully operation for them starting in the month of March. The business plan assumes um, just that, that that will open back up and full operation. Now, again, this is a budget. So depending on how we're actually operating, if there's no vaccine by then, and we feel like it's still in our best interest not to open facilities, then obviously there would be an impact um, of, a positive impact actually in the expense category, which would supersede the revenue loss. Um, it would just be the impact on, on our residents not having these facilities open. We'll continue obviously to um, look at all the options that we can with regards to outdoor activities where it's much safer and easier to me. Under um, human resource services, uh, the net cost of this department is 329,000 for the GF portion. Budget increases the assessment by $2,000 uh, this year. Uh, again, just minor increase in employee costs. Uh, maintenance and construction, the net cost to the department is $2.1 million um, for GRF. The budget increased the assessment by 288K due to a planned um, wage adjustment and related benefits. This goes back to union wages primarily uh, that affects the maintenance and construction and their benefits and a co correction to the allocation of administrative support. 
again, during that time where we went back um, between version one and version two, we're looking at appropriate allocations, making sure that they were allocated to the mutuals as well as GRF in an appropriate manner. And then finally, on our non-work center, um, includes in this budget is late fee revenue, um, but this has a um, positive uh, of two, $2,000 uh, um, where we made those adjustments in a non-work center category. The um, important part that we had a lot of dialogue at, at the um, in version one and, and certainly have had a lot of input from residents out there was um, what are we projecting um, to be at the end of 2020 and how are projections going with regards to savings that have occurred and additional expenses that have occurred with regards to GRF. Um, what this chart shows you is kind of a monthly uh, staggered account and what we're projecting for uh, December 31st, 2020. We started with the first closures in March, didn't affect too much in the sense of expense because we had our payroll still operational. Um, then in April is where we went into our furlough um, situation and closed down all the facilities. So we had um, very little expense there, also reduction in revenue, but um, you can see where that savings on a monthly basis uh, occurred in, in, in April, May, and June. And also, um, I'll let Betty talk a little bit about July because there was a, or Jose, one of us can talk about that. But at the end of the day, um, what we're projecting right now is um, a fund um, surplus at the end of the year of $2 million cumulative for GRF. And we've talked about where we would put that back into our uh, contingency and reserve balances. But I'll let, um, Betty or Jose talk about the uh, month of July. Good morning. Um, I don't have specific information for July, so Jose will look that up while we move on to reserves and we'll come back to that. Um, a portion of your budget, in addition to the operating, which Jeff just went over, we're gonna move on and go over the reserve items. Um, so next slide, Chris. We have two reserve funds, uh, or two funds that you contribute to. Your reserves, which are required by Davis Sterling, the civil code that ensures that a community association is putting aside money for the eventual repair or replacement of your major assets. And your contribution right now is $19 per manor per month, or $2.9 million into the reserve fund and that's based on a projected 30-year funding plan. And the board was able to avoid a projected increase of $5 per manor per month in this reserve contribution by reducing planned expenditures for 2020 and 2021. So by uh, looking at the priorities and uh, making some adjustments, uh, they've been able to bring down those expenditures, alleviate the uh, requirements of the reserve fund and maintain your current assessment of 2.9 million. Also in the contingency fund, um, this is money that's set aside for unexpected items that come up during the year and weren't anticipated in the annual budget. And we are making an assumption here that your current contribution of $764,000 in 2020 can go down to zero next year. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. So on the next slide, we look at the projected balance for your reserve fund. On the second column there, you can see that $19 contribution staying the same uh, for 2021. And your planned expenditures this year um, and next year include carryover for items that have already been approved by the board and given the um, uh, review that they will continue and anticipate those planned expenditures. So you're not just seeing the 2020 capital plan there, but also some carryovers from prior years. And so we're anticipating that reserve balance ending at about $19.5 million next year. And just for information on the accounting side, this is a consolidation of three funds, the equipment, fund, the facilities fund, and the trust facility fee fund. On the next slide, um, 
we put all those funds together to come up with your a 30-year funding plan. And this is the reserves plan that will be adopted by the board. Civil code allows for a threshold method of funding, which basically says the board focuses on the planned expenditures in future years and sets contributions to meet those expenditures without falling below a desired threshold. And um, we currently have a threshold of $7.4 million. We do apply a CPI factor to that, uh, which you can see on the next slide visually. We have the, can you go to the graph, Chris? I apologize, it was a couple more slides. There we go. Um, the blue dotted line at the bottom is this floor, if you will, this minimum threshold that the board does not want the balances to fall below. This is not a required number. It's just a comfort level, if you will, uh, where the board wants to um, maintain a, a certain amount of reserves even after you consider all your expenditures. And in orange, you, the line is showing the projected balances each year. So Civil Code does require a 30-year outlook and a disclosure to the members to say, are there sufficient funds to cover the expenditures over the next 30 years, or is there a special assessment anticipated? So this fund shows um, that the plan covers all the expenditures, stays above that threshold, and if the board were going to um, see a, foresee a problem with meeting that requirement, they could reevaluate their threshold and make a decision if it's too low or too high. Um, but this is what they've agreed to going forward. And so, Chris, if you'll go back to slide 16. And I know that this is um, nothing that is going to show up well on the TV screen for the residents watching from home. But um, for the board members who have their agenda package, what we're doing is following page 15. Uh, I misspoke earlier and said it was page 14. It's page 15 of your agenda package. And the full 30-year plan is shown there. We've just got a couple of excerpts here showing the first few years and the last few years. Um, and again, you're starting the year a balance of 21.3 million. And you've got contributions coming in from the assessment at $19 per manor per month. We also have investment income um, for those invested fund balances. And then that middle column I wanted to point out, that's your facility fee fund. That's the $5,000 transfer fee that's charged uh, when there's a title transfer. And that is a revenue source that contributes in addition to your assessments. Um, it helps keep those assessments down. And as Jeff showed in a prior slide, the historical um, look at your assessments, we've been able to keep them level over the last um, dozen years because it was in um, 2011 or 2012 that you started this facility fee. And that transfer fee has helped fund your reserves and keep your assessments down. So moving on to the contingency fund, slide 18, doing a five-year projection here. This is not required by civil code. As I mentioned, this is just, uh, if you will, a savings account uh, for contingencies or unexpected items. And one of the big unexpected items you're having is the results of the COVID shutdown and the associated savings, um, especially in the area of recreation, for the facilities that are shut down and um, we are not, uh, with furloughed employees, we're not having the expenses that were anticipated this year. And so the surplus that we're projecting is about $2 million. And our recommendation to the board was to transfer all $2 million into the contingency fund because it's the most flexible use of that money for unexpected items of which um, your expenditure that is not expected um, or is, you know, we have not built up to it, we're expecting a significant increase in your property insurance for next year. That renewal, unfortunately, does not come about before the budget is set. And so we have transferred a portion of that increase of your um, property insurance to this contingency fund. 
since it's unknown at this time, it's like a, a, a known unknown, if that makes any sense. We know the property insurance is going up, but it's being marketed and negotiated right now. And so we've put um, a portion of the costs in the operating budget. And then um, the more significant increase here of um, 900, almost a million dollars, we've added to the planned expenditures in 2021 as a means of using up that prior surplus. That surplus gets returned to members, and the way that we return it, since we, we can't really write individual $100 checks and um, the administrative task of sending that out to members, um, partial ownerships throughout the year and so forth, the, the means by which the boards have returned the surplus to you is to uh, fund your reserves. And so in 2020, the second column, third column here, and the contribution, you can see that we've increased that by $2 million um, above the $5 assessment. We're adding the $2 million transfer from operating surplus. And by doing so, we're able to eliminate that $5 assessment in the following year and even alleviate the assessment in the years after. And you can see in 2022, um, just a $1 assessment, $2 and $3. And that maintains your fund balance um, between 1.6 and $2 million over the next several years. So we think with the, the variables, not knowing exactly how much you're gonna end up the year with your operating surplus and not knowing yet how much uh, the property insurance increase is going to land at through the negotiations, um, we felt that this was the best place to handle those fluctuations. And so we'll just end now um, on the last slide and open it up to questions. And um, uh, well, before we do, we will um, just add a couple of comments about the, um, the projected surplus of $2 million. On that slide, you had seen that July went down and we didn't see as much surplus in July as anticipated. So, sorry, Chris, I'm gonna have you bounce back to slide 13. Just so that's up on the screen um, while we talk about the July results. Good morning, this is Jose Campos, the financial services manager. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, July results. And you saw uh, kind of an anomaly here as your surplus uh, increased, but didn't increase at the same rate it had been in the past several months. And there are a couple reasons uh, as to why. The first of which is gonna be a, a timing issue on advertising revenue. As we know, um, we're getting a lot of uh, political type of advertising revenue. However, July didn't show that, um, and we'll be receiving that revenue in the months to follow. So the revenue is coming, it's just uh, not recorded in July. Also, uh, some of our utility bills, we didn't receive any June bills, uh, for example, in broadband. Um, so when July rolled around, we ended up paying two different bills. So you see about a $40,000 swing there. We also had a couple of quarterly expenses that happened in July um, that you don't see in some of the previous months. And those include the association dues for the community center. Um, we also had some DMV registration dues that were due. Um, and some HR safety consultant uh, fees that were paid. So because of some of the added expenditures in July, we didn't get to see the benefit of, of the surplus, but, but again, the, the big issue there is gonna be the advertising revenue that, that will be coming as the, as the election draws to an end. Thank you, Jose. So I, uh, we have, um, as Betty indicated, um, we have some questions, so Chris, are you gonna walk through them and we can answer them or we can go off the chat however you'd like to do that? Hey John, it's Chris in the boardroom. Did you want me to go through the chat box or did you wanna go through it? Yeah, just run down the chat box starting with uh, Rosemary's comment at uh, 10.30. And I mean, that, to <laughs> summarize that first question, unless Rosemary wants to comment directly, she kind of wrote it up as a question. Just wanna make sure all, fees, revenues that were being collected in the clubhouse was net against the savings that you projected. Um, the particular things, Bridge Club uh, revenue and other types of revenue like that, were they netted against the uh, expense savings or the numbers you projected? Yes, we, we considered both revenue and expenses in those projections. Um, may I say something, John? 
Absolutely. Um, I I heard Jeff and I had a meeting with uh, with Wayne Ming, and we were discussing the budgets and other things. And the basic thing is, is we had discussed in the past that the Bridge Club is in no position to be reopening, and that that revenue, which is straight revenue, should have been reduced, and it hasn't been reduced. Uh, because there are no plans to open that up because of, of the health things and touching cards, et cetera, et cetera. But also, if you were if you were looking at the revenue, uh, and Jeff mentioned staff cut tax for non not having the clubhouses, the revenue is still too high. I know that you've taken into consideration staff cuts, but the revenue is still rather high. Uh, and then we start ourselves off, whether it's in March or whatever, in trouble because um, people are, you know, most places aren't thinking that they're going to do any scheduling, whether it's the Opera House or Soka or whatever, until January, February. We know that it's probably later than that. So we should probably be looking at revenues starting closer to June, revenue and expenses closer to June. Senior community, virus going mad, virus not established. So I really believe we should look at that again. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the opportunity to speak. No problem. Um, all right, Chris, let's go back to you. I'll let you run through the box from there. I just wanted to cover that one because she had written a question out. Over to you. Sounds good. Thanks, John. Our next uh, request to speak is from Dick Rader. <clears throat> Thank you. On slide eight, which was changes from Burgess one budget, I believe it showed that you're going to take uh, $669 from contingency fund. I believe it was mainly for insurance purposes to cover that, that expense and that the contingency fund would be uh, supplemented by savings due to the fact that we're not fully operational. My concern is eventually we're going to be back to normal. We're not going to have these savings to supplement contingency. And somewhere along the line, we're going to have to, it seems to me, ask for an increase of not only the 669 for the insurance, but each subsequent year, the insurance is going to go up, maybe not as large as these, these uh, years now, but it's going to go up. So I'm concerned that we're taking care of ourselves now, but there may be sudden increases in subsequent years to cover the insurance. I, I think um, to Mr. Rader, I think the if, the, if we go to the chart um, again, that shows the contingency, the in this year, obviously we were looking at the, the shutdown of COVID-19 um, impact um, and being able to transfer that into the contingency. Uh, down at the footnotes, down at the bottom, it talks about the, t um, the $2 million transfer and the, and the expense. If, um, if we um, back are in full operation um, at, in March, um, then what we projected within the budget um, will, will match. If the operations stay closed longer, then there will be actually more um, fund balance money or operating surplus that could be, again, put back into the contingency fund. But what, what you see on this chart is that starting in 2022 at, at a dollar and then 2023 and 24, um, we are going back into a per manner um, cost increase, contribution increase um, that will allow you to keep that fund balance as Betty indicated, between 1.6 million and 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 two million dollars, um, which was the um, goal that the GRF board had set for um, the contingency fund. So may I just ask, uh, in 22 and 23 projection, you have included the 669 plus any extra increase uh, that the insurance companies may impose on us has been included and taken into account for 2020, for these two years, 22 and 23 contingency fund? No, not in the contingency fund. Um, we have assumed that 
a portion of the increase in 2021 in the operating budget and a portion here in the contingency fund. In 2022, our plan will be to fund everything from the operating budget for insurance and um, then we'll, we'll deal with the, the program and the cost and any potential increases at that time. But we have not projected insurance increases from the contingency fund <coughs> other than 2021. It, and Dick, we did that because of the surplus. We're doing a one-time transfer of a surplus this year into that fund and um, want to use a portion of that for your unexpected property insurance increase. Well, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but somewhere along the line, uh, you have to cover the insurance costs. And in uh, your budget, future budgets, have you allocated that amount of money, that $6 and for this year, and then it will be 7 or 8 next year? Uh, have it, has that been taken into account for the future budgets? You're just going to wait and see what happens. Not for the contingency fund. And the operating budget is only one year, so we don't have a projected operating budget for 2022. Um, but we have not included insurance costs currently in this projected contingency fund budget. Thank you. Our next request to speak is from Juanita. Juanita, you had a comment about um, the distinction between uh, not zero assessment and zero increase on assessments. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think all the directors on the call understand exactly what uh, uh, particularly Jeff was saying, but when you say zero assessment and it goes out to our residents, they think zero assessment. It's zero increase in assessment. They're still going to be getting the $205 assessment. Um, and as long as I'm on, let me just do my second question. In the um, uh, chart, and I don't have the slides in my agenda package, just the information, uh, but in the chart that was funding by department, um, it showed that there was $132 for recreation that was... Uh, no, that's contingency. Anyway, it, it should have been a decrease rather than an increase because it went down from 6312 6, to 6180. So that $132 should be in parentheses as a dis decrease rather than an increase. I you're, think. you're right, Juanita. That's an error on the slide. We'll, we'll make that correction. Thank you. Our next request to speak is from uh, Kushbata. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, good catch, Juanita. Thank you. Uh, I've been I've been following this, and uh, I'm looking at the page nine of thirty-seven, and also at the total number of staff that we have decreased. We decreased 27 positions, so our payroll cost, instead of going down, has gone up by 30, 300,000 or more. So that's a difficult thing to understand unless we're giving big bonuses or raises to people, how that could happen. And while I'm on, the, on this thing, I want to point out that the trash cost for which is on the same page 9 of 37 uh, it should be going down because i think uh, director horton had negotiated or is working on getting the cost of pickup trash pickup being going down by about 70000 or more and then there is also two other things which is just my lack of understanding maybe, but I understand that we have an IP telephone system where the cost of our telephones or the use of telephones is over the internet, many of it. Uh, I know we may have some copper lines too, but the telephone cost should be going down rather than going up, and so is the cable TV cost because we reduced a number of channels earlier. So, 
this is all I have to say right now and uh, help me understand all these increases. Thank you. And, and remind me if I miss a couple of them, but the trash, if you're talking about the anticipated change for the manure disposal at the equestrian center, uh, we've we've left That's correct. we've left it in the budget because we um, we don't have a final uh, resolution on that solution yet. We have taken it out of the boarding fee, so the boarding fee is not going to include the manure disposal. Um, and whether it ends up being a recreation um, cost as is or transferred to um, landscape as part of the um, composting program, it has yet to be determined. So that is an item that is still in the budget and um, you know, we, we just have to go with a budget assumption for now, but the program will determine how those costs come in next year. And then on the telephone, the reason the telephone costs are going up is the increased in-field data collection and the devices in the field require larger data plans, and so it's the cellular data plans that you're seeing for field operations that's driving the increase in that telephone budget, not the, the telephone, regular telephone line costs. And was there a, a third item you asked about? Was it cable TV or internet? Yeah, there was cable TV and the staff cost, the payroll cost. Okay, well, I'd, I'd have to pull that up. I don't have that detail in this presentation. Okay. It's, it's in that package that we received. I'll just give you the page number for you to review. It's on page uh, 36 or 37. Total number of uh, people reduced is 23, not 27. 23. So page 36 of 37, which department? Overall, the top line, all departments. Oh, right. 23.15 positions have been reduced. Correct. Correct? Yes. Much of that I'm is... I'm looking at the overall picture. Right, the total picture, that is down mostly because of outsourcing. Um, two outsourced operations in landscape and in um, general services and those um, custodial and tree trimming items that are being outsourced, there's outside services that are offsetting the reduction there in the payroll. And then also in the Department of Maintenance, the um, Third Mutual decided to go to a 15-year paint program and so you'll see right. big reductions there in carpentry and paint departments um, because of extending out that paint cycle. But Betty, on page 9 of 37, where you see the uh, employee compensation lines, the two, the top two lines, uh, if you see the reduction is, I mean, there's an increase of 300,000 instead of it going down, it's going up. So I'm wondering if we reduce the number of employees and our payroll is going up, that means it's, is, it, is there a clerical error or oh, no. are we giving? On, on the staffing levels, when we report uh, full-time equivalents, we're reporting all the staffing, the shared staff for GRF, United, and Third. But on the business plan, page nine of the agenda, we're looking at just GRF's portion. So those programs that I mentioned, the staffing reductions are mutual programs. Um, the janitorial, the tree trimming, and the paint cycle, those are all mutual impact. Um, we didn't have any significant reductions on the GRF uh, side of payroll. Okay, so when you look at the full line, it will show a decrease in the payroll? In the which line? All, when you see it overall, over all the mutuals, will it make a difference in the payroll? Uh, let me pull that up here and uh, let you know because the um, wage adjustments in, are in there for existing personnel. But if I look at top side, like we did in the all boards, all directors meeting um, back at the beginning of version one, 
um, we, we had a, a combined look at compensation. So I just pulled it up, and overall, your compensation is going down $135,780 between all three corporations. And so percentage-wise, it doesn't really measure as a percentage, but it's going from um, basically $38,865 million down to $38,729 million. And so the right. staffing reductions are taken into account there, but you also have the, the contracted and the planned increases for the wage adjustments. Okay. Uh, who's next, Chris? Sure. Our next request to speak is from Dick Rader on slide eight. Thank you, but my question was addressed. As long as, long as we have slide eight up, I'm going to insert a question. It's uh, really simple, and then we can go to the, uh, the box. Um, is it fair to say that we've increased our budget overall by $2 million, but ended up with a zero assessment by taking a $2 million surplus from this year's savings? and applying that to offset that increase? Is that a one sentence summary of what's happened with these changes, more or less? Uh, it's probably a fair um, summary to say that we moved much of the property insurance increase out of operating and to your contingency fund, and funding that through um, the operating surplus. So moving the operating surplus to contingency fund and moving a large portion of your insurance increase to the contingency fund. Right, okay, well, so that's just a matter of accounting. I mean, you're going to pay an expense, yeah. so you're going to get a million of it out of the uh, assessment, um, but it's going to be from the contingency fund rather than the operating yeah. expense fund. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. But overall, overall, if I'm just trying to look at dollars and cents, we're going to spend $2 million more in 2021 than 2020. It just so happens we happen to have that in the savings that we did not spend this year. Correct. Okay. Very good. Um, okay, back to the box. Our next request to speak is from Steve Parsons on slide nine. Actually, I apologize, Steve. Uh, Bert, you had a question about um, uh, that's in the chat box. Did you want to speak about it? Yes, uh, I, I did. Uh, a couple of things. One is uh, that I didn't listen to the chat box, and that is, have we factored in the percentage increase that we anticipate from SCE for energy? We know that uh, SCE is going to be paying horrendous insurance charges, just like we are. And they have already gone to the CPUC, and apparently they are requesting something like a 14% increase. Uh, the CPUC probably won't give them that 14%. But we can probably expect a big boost in energy cost. Um, so that's the first part. Second part is my concern is that we're looking to hire a facilities manager for energy. Uh, I'm thinking if I were an experienced facilities manager, one of the first questions I'd be asking is, well, what type of budget do I have to work with? And I don't think we have anything uh, in, in this plan. Uh, to provide a budget for this specific individual. So I don't know how he's going to be effective. Thank you. Our next request to speak is from uh, Steve Parsons on slide nine. Uh, hang on there. No question. Is it, isn't Wei Ming in front of that? 1115, Wei Ming. Yes, you're correct. Go ahead, Wei Ming. Okay. Uh, I rec it is very important that we show the proper. This is the same thing happened to Third Mutual. The property insurance is an expense item. It has to show in the budget as expense. So we have we need to increase. This is the, my recommendation for. Totally is the same, but showing it differently. 
to for the expenses, we show increase of nine hundred ninety four thousand and six hundred thirty six dollars. That's a change of per manner per hour, uh, per manner per month of six dollars and fifty one cents. And in the line of it to it contingency fund, that's what we normally show the two million dollars. So we'll show a negative surplus, show a negative of two million dollars, a uh, negative number for plus into contingency fund. That's the change of a negative thirteen dollars and nine cents. And that the in the fund contribution section, the contingency fund will will increase it by a million five thousand three sixty four, which is six six dollars and fifty eight cents. That's the changes, and that still is a total still to zero. That way, people can see because we've been telling people insurance increase and the surplus from this year will be will, will be well, you guys will get it a refund or or transfer to to contingency. If we don't show it there, the community is going to be really upset. So by showing it this way, you show the $2 million paying back into the contingency fund, which is $13, and then you show an increase of property insurance of $6.51, and that's still the same. And then the remaining $6.58 is in contingency fund. That way, it's so much better. Show it as, you know, totally is the same, but show it so much better that for the the community, you have the number to show it to them. Yeah, on the agenda, page 11 of 22 shows the full insurance cost for GRF. Uh, Betty, is that, you're, you're muted. Am I, Chris? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Jump in whenever you get your speaker back. I don't, you've lost it somehow. Um, Chris, did, that's eerie. Please enter your access code followed by the pound or hash. To enable auto control. If we take the surplus and put it in the contingency fund, we'll reserves and then take the money from source out of reserve, it's almost like uh, we're not being um, open, um, whatever we're supposed to be. So I think that I'm not I'm not talking about a change of the numbers. I'm talking about for both GRF and, and third. We're going to talk about it again. Uh, being more specific. So the people are asking, you know, we're saying, well, aren't we going to get a refund? I think that you really have to talk about what happens with insurance. All of the fabulous work you're trying to do with insurance. This is what's going to happen, but we also have this left, and that this is how it's going to look. I think that's important, and I believe a lot of directors will agree with me. Thank you. Um, so, Betty, I, I looks like you still can't speak, but no, we we got. We okay, got the call back. I apologize. We were off, so I didn't hear everything that was said. But I was just trying to point out on page 11 of 22 for, I'm sorry, page 11. I, I've got United in front of me. GRF on um, the agenda, page um, 11 of 37. No, we'll flip the page to page 12. So uh, the agenda for this meeting is issued and is available to the public. And on page 12 of 37, towards the bottom, the um, entire insurance budget is shown there. Um, but it is just the operating portion. And so what we'll do is similar to what Third had asked us is for the final version of the budget for GRF, we will make sure to um, make some notes on the business plan and make sure that the, t the total cost of insurance, both the operating portion and the reserve portion is identified so that it um, 
is understood in its entirety. Um, the footnote in just the contingency fund, I can see where you're feeling that it's not enough just to talk about it in contingency, but to mention it over in the operating budget as well. So they both point back to each other and you, and uh, regardless of which side you're looking at, you can see the whole total cost for the insurance program. Let me ask you a related question. With all the efforts that a good chunk of people are making to try to control those costs, if they come in at or below, well, let's say below what you projected in the budget, will that just end up increasing the contingency of those dollars? Can we just flow those dollars right into contingency in the sense that they're not being spent out of contingency? Right. That's why we thought it would be best to handle it in the contingency fund because that where you've got the most um, unknown right now on what your surplus will end at the uh, by the end of the year and where you'll land with the insurance renewal cost. So we put both of those unknowns in the contingency fund. And so um, your balance will be lower if the insurance costs go higher or if the surplus doesn't materialize to the full 2.2 million that we anticipated. Or um, if the insurance comes in much lower cost or if you have more surplus, then your contingency fund balance will be much higher. And then it's at the board's discretion how to direct the use of those funds. Um, there are some more questions in the box. Let's go back in order to that. Um, Chris, I think it picks up with uh, Juanita. She's, she hit the wrong key. No, she was asking for somebody to call. I think Manny will probably be next, but I'll turn it back over to you. Our next request to speak is from Manny. Manny, all you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to clarify something that uh, Betty has explained pretty carefully already, but uh, it's often misunderstood. Uh, the increased insurance of about eight or nine hundred thousand dollars to GRF uh, only affects the amount of assessment is passed on down to the member through the mutual, United or Third. And so it has really no direct impact on the amount that that member will see on his assessment letter that he gets for the year. And that's where, uh, regardless of where it's paid from, that's just cash flow. When you get your statement for assessment this year, no matter what happens, unless you get a credit for the basic assessment, you're going to have an increase in your line item for insurance. It's a separate item. So if you're a third or if you're united, if you take a look at the bottom line, the total assessment, including GRF, multiply times 12, multiply times the number of units, you will not come up with that total because you have to add back in property taxes and insurance, which is a separate line item. So what I'm saying is if last year your assessment for insurance was $12 per month per unit, and your insurance cost doubled, your assessment then has to go up to $24 per month per month. In order to offset that, you would have to have a reduction in other cost items that are in your basic assessment. So the fact that GRF is going to fund this <clears throat> out of contingency, uh, Betty has been right up front and explained it all. And, and the only question I would say is that it is known, but by definition, the amount is not known. So that's why they're paying it out of contingency. But as far as accounting and all that, when you get your audit financial statement at the end of the year, all of these income and expense items, whether they're reserves, whether they're operations, they all get reported by the general ledger account. So insurance as a total figure is going to appear as insurance, whether no matter where it got paid from. So right now, <clears throat> this is a different means of providing where you are going to try to get the money from to cover these things. So I wouldn't disturb the way they presented it and how they're showing it and where they're taking it from. I'm glad uh, they're not increasing assessments for that. Uh, so again, when you get to third, be aware that no matter what gets presented to you or united, that insurance, your assessment for insurance is going to go up. And the only way you're going to be able to have a reduction for that is if you come up with a net credit <clears throat> as far as a decrease in your assessment from last year. 
I just want to explain that so people would understand it because they really don't. Thank you. Our next request to speak is from Carl. Yeah, I wrote in the chat box about the fact that uh, this year we've been told by our friends at uh, El Toro Water District that we're going to have possibility of a ex substantial increase in our water bill. And uh, we talked about utilities here, talked about increases in in electric and telephone and what have you. But did we address the potential or actually it's supposed to be a substantial increase in water? Did we take care of that in our uh, in our estimates that we've made? So we did get the notice um, and of their rate increases and the tiered water rates are about a, a CPI level increase, which is what we assumed for the budget next year. And we're checking right now on the residential um, sewer to see if we had enough of an increase in there uh, for their proposal. Thank you. Um, John, I believe that's it, unless you have a question about Rosemary or Rosemary, did you want to Express your comments. Uh, Juanita, Juanita has her question at 1125. I don't know if it's additional or not. She's on the um, my comments are, are for John to know the answer to, and I believe we did discuss them at Wednesday finance meeting. Is that okay, John? Yes, I'm great. Juanita, did you have another question? I'll come in. That's my question. Yeah. We are on television, and hopefully many residents are watching this. The uh, issue of refunds keeps coming up, and Betty answered it, but she talked about it from an administrative point of view and what a nightmare it would be to try to do any kind of a refund. I'd like to speak to it from the United point of view, and I think third and GRF are pretty close. We cannot legally do refunds. Our occupancy agreement, which everybody signed, prohibits refunds. It says specifically that any overages has to be turned back into the next year's budget, but that we cannot refund to the individual members. So um, I, I think we need to put that question to bed. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, I did have one other question. I suppose it's for Jose. Um, I know this happened in third. You just mentioned it here, GRF. Um, are we going to see any more of these July uh, out of the ordinary expenses that are going to eat into the surplus? I mean, is that whether there are several things that were one time events or are there things we've been missing all year long that are now about to start showing up month to month and reduce the surplus we're expecting? I don't have the United or Thirds numbers with me right now, but I'll take a look at it right after this meeting and uh, let you know how July is looking. Or looked. Okay. All right, very good. Um, no other questions in the box. Do we have any other questions from anyone at this point? Just throw a question mark in there. You get called in right away. And I just would like to remind the, I'd just like to remind the GF board that if there is um, any change that you want to direct for the final business plan, that today is the day to do so. You have a very early board meeting this year. Um, the first Tuesday of the month, you know, September 1st is on a Tuesday. And so um, we will be recalculating the budget as soon as we finish with third's meeting on this Thursday. And uh, as soon as that meeting is over on the 20th, we're going to recalculate the budget and get those resolutions prepared for issuing GRF's agenda next week, um, early next week. And that budget resolution requires all three of the corporations to be finished with their deliberations. And so these meetings this week are very important. And so I just, I don't want anybody to walk away from this meeting thinking that there's um, still time or still another version of the budget before it's reduced down to a resolution for adoption. Right. The, the question I started to cut you off, which I apologize, I was about to ask is if while we're waiting for any other questions, would anybody you would like to make a motion? Oh, 
probably comfortable enough to get this approved to move forward is really the hidden question I'm asking our board. No longer hidden, now very direct. And if not, why not? We need some specifics here. I mean, I feel like we've got everything that we were requesting. Um, the notion of using our contingency fund is not, you know, ideal, but we are currently working on ways to reduce that, and they've accounted for it in a way that will let us keep those funds right in contingency if we can find savings that we're going to be, uh, you know, working on through the rest of the year and, and ongoing, you know, insurance in particular. So it may end up worse, but it might also end up better. There's a couple methods by which it could. Um, I will. I, I feel comfortable. I, I'm impressed with the adjustments. I think they're reasonable. Um, I'll make them sound if we approve the budget as proposed by staff. Do we have a second? I second Jim Hopkins. Okay, any other uh, discussion on that motion now? Hearing none, I will move the question. Um, I feel it's important enough that we're going to need an actual count on this. So all those in favor of approving staff's recommendation for no assessment increase for 2021 as spelled out in the uh, staff report in the budget, uh, put yes in the chat box. If you can't do that, then you'll need to either raise your hand or just say yes. Oops. I'm in the wrong thing. I'm about to do this. This would be strictly GRF board members voting. We've got Don Tibbetts is a yes. I'm a yes. So, uh, Gann is a yes. Chris, are you kind of catching this as we go? So, we'll have a count. Yeah, I'll catch Tony it. Is a yes. yeah. yeah, let us know what your count is once you get a chance to see all this. There's uh, four GR board members in the chat box. I see uh, Sue Stevens is out there. I don't know if, if she's able to type a yes, or maybe she doesn't want to vote yes. That could be a problem. You gotta give her a chance. Okay, so let's go the other way. That was adequate time. Uh, all those against, type no in the chat box or put yourself on the screen, raise your hand. Let us know somehow that you are voting no on this uh, motion. Okay, we need one more. How many? There's six. I mean, uh, one. Two, three, four, myself is five. And Don, Don Tibbetts sure, raised his hand. Yes. So Don Tibbetts is a yes. Don Tibbetts is a yes. Dan is okay. a yes. Yeah, Chris is catching all that, hopefully. And then Sue, okay. your, your mic's on. Did you want to vote yes or no so we know how to count you? I don't see Sue here. I do. Okay. Okay, do you? Okay, Don says yes. Two. So, Chris, what are you talking about? Yes. Six with John. You have six with John. Okay. Where are we, Chris? Just to be sure official. Sure. So, we have votes for yes. Is it Director Tibbetts, uh, Egon? Uh, 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 you can type your yes or no in the box, Yvonne, if your audio is not working. I abstain. Okay, abstain. Okay. Sue is voting yes. So we, and then Judith, I see it down there also. I don't know what her vote may be. You want to keep your streak alive, Judith? <laughs> Just let her know what you, you know, yes or no if you feel like it's ready to move ahead. In any event, we have enough mo votes to carry the motion. I'd just like to get an accurate count. We got, we got, nine, we got nine yes to one no. Certain Muldown no. Not another yeses. 
Right, we're waiting on Judith. But again, you're right, Manny. Uh, All right, hello. Can you, yes. can you talk to me now? Sure. So finally, because I, I keep talking, and I, nobody can hear me. Um, yeah, I vote a no. Okay, so the motion passes 9 to 2. Correct, Chris? That's the count I have. That's. Yeah, that's what we got. That's correct. Okay. Not like it's not a dynamic program that will be keeping managers. There's a lot of financial analysis coming, but I do feel this delivered on the promises that you know we tried to make to our residents about controlling costs for the next 12 months due to COVID, and we can you know use this as a baseline to try to improve things. Um, final, well, let's see. Um, Let's move on to board member comments. Uh, I have a quick one, but I'll, let, I'll open it up to the board first. Any other comments by board members in the meeting? Just put a question mark in the box and you'll go right away. Eight, I'm sorry, thank you. Betty corrected eight, two to one. We did have an abstention, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll make my board member comment, put a question. Oh, Judith, please go ahead. He's gonna go last, you go ahead. Can you, can you hear me now? We can, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I did have a couple of comments during the meeting, but for some reason, when I called in, they never asked me for a name, a caller, so I don't know why I didn't show up. I heard the whole meeting. I mean, I was here, but, um, so, okay, I didn't know if I had to explain why I just said no at this time, but we need to figure out why when I called in that you guys couldn't see me at that end. Um, because that was the problem because none of my I on the phone I'm not able to have chat box so uh, that was a little frustrating but uh, okay so I'm here now and um, there are reasons that I sent to Bunny why I was against this so but going forward we will have discussion I guess at closed meeting and uh, go from there so anyway I just need us to check out why they, when I called in, they didn't register me on the screen that I was calling. Maybe that's a glitch somewhere. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Judy. Um, on my comment, since I'm seeing nobody else, in case anybody else wants to jump in, just throw a question mark in the box, but simply stated that this budget, you know, covers the most important priorities for operations. Um, it has, you know, adequate reserves. We all know, and several have asked for comments about some of the big projects that we're just starting to dig into and work on, or so with Performing Arts Center, Clubhouse One. Um, you know, those, those fundings are, are going to be looked at carefully and made sure that they're accounted for with as much transparency as I'm able to provide before anything is put forth for even our approval. Or we have a chance to review it, understand it, and evaluate it. So, um, you know, there were some comments made about looking to the future as in addition to controlling costs today. And I think we've managed things as well as they can be managed so for this particular budget at this particular time. But these committees are gonna be working really hard on how to find the money without affecting assessments dramatically for those larger, more long-term projects. I just wanted anyone listening to know that that is not forgotten. We know we need to do it. And a lot of us are on this board to make sure it's done as carefully as possible. Anybody else have any other comments? Jim Hopkins, did you want to go ahead and make that a, a comment? Feel free to do that. Yes. Um, I was wondering whether or not we could introduce an accrual process for major income slash expenditures to avoid the explanation of timing for the actual expenditures? Daddy, did you want to spend any time responding to that? Can you repeat the question? Basically, we <laughs> looking to understand if we can develop some sort of accrual process for things that we know are coming that won't be addressed. You know, our budget's month to month. The things we talk about quite often, I mean, it's just wondering if, there, if there's a way that we're building to address it and get more actual to match, you know, uh, expenses we know we're going to incur versus simply reporting equal month by month. Right. So those yeah, unexpected quarterly payments, I'm sure it was what you're uh, referring to. And the, the significant one is the 
broadband franchise fees. And so we'll look at that and possibly booking an accrual monthly instead of waiting for the quarterly payment. Yeah, and I, I was really referring to all uh, those types of expenditures where we know they're coming, but maybe there's a delayed billing or delayed income for that matter, yeah. uh, so that we can have a smoother effect on our actual month to month. Yes, we do use accrual-based accounting. Uh, we accrue for all large expenditures, such as payroll, um, legal fees, and insurance. And so that's what I was saying. I think we can add to that um, one of the more one of the remaining ones that we don't accrue for that is had a significant impact on July is those quarterly fees that are paid. So we'll look at that. Last call for board comments. Any other board member comments since we're all in our virtual room or anybody would like to make a final comment? Okay. And, uh, I appreciate the staff's effort on this. Um, we'll have a finance meeting Wednesday where we can continue to dig into any items. Some questions already got raised, but this budget will move forward as proposed. And I will call this meeting adjourned. Thank you for coming. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John.